Hi, I'm Joseph Feinstein, founder of Himalayan Bowls. I wrote the Singing Bowl book to inform the world about the history, manufacture, traditional and modern uses of singing bowls. Here I'm reading my book, The Singing Bowl Book, which is available at the links below on Amazon and on my website, HimalayanBowls.com. Introduction in 1998, I asked a question that changed my life. What is a singing bowl? Have you asked the same question? This is your guide to discover the answer. As the leading singing bowl expert, it is my goal to share everything I know about these wonderful objects. For the first time, the origin, history, and manufacture of singing bowls will be explained. I explain the many uses for singing bowls, including their traditional use in Asia and modern Western developments. I provide valuable information about how to shop for singing bowls, how to use them, how they are made, what they are made from, how to discern antiques from new singing bowls, and much more. I share ideas about using singing bowls in meditation, sound healing, music, and how singing bowls can be part of a healthy life. As a longtime collector, seller, teacher, and researcher, I explain the real history and use of singing bowls and dispel the common myths perpetuated in recent years. I present real information in a direct way, helping you understand these wonderful objects and helping you avoid the common pitfalls in shopping for them. Whether you are discovering singing bowls for the first time or have been using them for years, this is your comprehensive guide to understanding and enjoying them fully. You will learn about their important place in world cultural history, secrets of examining antiques, and tips for playing singing bowls. With this guide, you can look at any singing bowl and know the age, quality, and value. With over 140 photos and a wealth of information, this is the ultimate singing bowl book. I spent years developing an understanding of the origins and historical spread of singing bowls throughout Asia. Conducting research around the world, my historical theories are based on physical, cultural, and scientific investigation. My research has led me to museums, universities, and temples in 10 countries. Working with scientists, monks, collectors, folklorists, and generations of families, I have gained unique knowledge about singing bowls. For years, little has been known about the real history of singing bowls. This book reveals the results of my research, sharing the secrets and facts about these mysterious and captivating objects. I tell the cultural story of how the bowls have been made and how they spread across Asia centuries ago. I explain how they have been used in various cultures and how they are used today. Singing bowls are one of the world's most revered musical instruments. They're important as objects of cultural significance and as beautiful musical instruments. To really answer the question, what is a singing bowl, you must hold one in your hands, feel the smooth vibration, and hear the enchanting sound. The answer requires an experience which supersedes any facts or ideas. If you have never held a singing bowl, I encourage you to get one in your hands and enjoy the amazing feeling of the vibration. This book will help you make an informed choice when shopping for singing bowls and avoid overpaying for an inferior quality singing bowl. If you are already a singing bowl collector, you know they're special. For the first time, you can read about the real history and traditional uses of singing bowls without all the fabricated myths. Part history book, part practical guide, my goal is to provide you with information and inspiration to get the most from your singing bowl experience. Here I offer the first comprehensive history of singing bowls, placing them in their proper context as significant cultural artifacts and enduring examples of traditional artisanship. I will show you how singing bowls are not an isolated development but part of a broad tradition spanning many cultures. I'll take you on a journey over thousands of years and around the world to explain the origins and development of these instruments. I explain how the various types of bowls are made. I also explain the results of the first ever metallurgical research, which revealed the true content of singing bowl metal.
Contrary to the common internet myths, singing bowls are part of the ancient bronze-making tradition, as proved by their metal content. Various traditions must be considered to understand the development of singing bowls across Asia. While I give examples from different countries, my focus is on Himalayan singing bowls. Himalayan singing bowls are the most historically significant and also sound the best. They are by far the most desirable to collectors. Using photographic examples, I explain how to tell antiques from new bowls and discuss issues when shopping for singing bowls. I offer suggestions and guidelines for getting the most out of your singing bowls, including using them in meditation, education, and how to get started with sound healing. I provide detailed playing instructions which are useful for musicians, therapists, and general collectors. This book has been years in the making because I want to tell you everything I know about singing bowls. Singing bowls have been my passion, my hobby, my art, and my business since I was in my 20s. I'm one of the only true experts working exclusively with singing bowls. They've been central in my life since I first discovered them in 1998. I've studied singing bowls very carefully with the help of experts around the world. This book is intended to be accurate and factual as well as creative and inspiring. Where do singing bowls come from? How did they evolve? How are they made? What are they made of? How are they traditionally used? How are they used today? Why is the sound so special? How can I choose a good one? Is it a real antique? How do they help people? Why do they make the environment feel so good? How are they used in meditation? These are some of the questions that have come up for myself, my customers, and my students over the years. Here you will find the answers, some of which may surprise you. I hope you become as inspired as I have been for all these years. Please feel free to contact me personally by email, joseph at himalayanbowls.com, or visit himalayanbowls.com and reach me by live chat uh, or through the contact form. You can also read many reviews and comments, watch more free videos, and more. I welcome your questions and comments. That's me with my personal set of 63 harmonious antique singing bowls. You can hear all of them on the recording Himalayan Bowls, which is available for free here on YouTube or for download on the website. Chapter 1. What is a singing bowl? The three basic shapes of Himalayan singing bowls are pictured. The low-sided singing bowl, a straight-sided, and a round bottom. A singing bowl is a type of bronze bowl that makes a beautiful sound. They are a type of bell found in various regions of Asia. Like other bells, they make a ringing sound when struck. They sound best when struck with a soft padded mallet. They can also be played in a unique manner by rubbing a wood or leather mallet around the rim to produce a continuous singing sound. Singing bowls hold a special place in human history. They sit directly on the crossroads of several cultures. They are a remnant of an unbroken tradition of Bronze Age craftsmanship that has continued for thousands of years. Singing bowls are among the most beautiful sounding objects ever made. Their appearance range from rustic to finely crafted. Some are plain, others are delicately engraved. Some have an uneven shape, others are nearly perfect in form. Singing bowls have a long history. They have been used in Asia for centuries. In recent decades, they have spread around the world. Collectors from all walks of life enjoy them as art objects, musical instruments, as well as tools for meditation and health. They have become famous in recent years for their special power to calm the mind, foster harmony, and promote well-being. Singing bowls have a profound effect on us personally and also transform any environment. Many people agree that singing bowls provide health benefits, whether by simply helping us relax or possibly with more profound and far-reaching results. Singing bowls evolved over a long period of time, and the best examples display masterful artistry. The oldest singing bowls found today are about 800 years old. Their predecessors, which were not used for sound, date as far back as 1200 years old. 
While it is impossible to know exactly when bronze bowls began to be used for sound, it was approximately 800 to 1,000 years ago. Singing bowls are one of the last remnants of the bronze-making tradition that goes back more than 5,000 years. They're still made today using ancient technologies lost to the rest of the world. Himalayan singing bowls are the most diverse, beautiful, and culturally important. The real history of singing bowls is fragmented by culture and time, so it must be pieced together using existing examples. Based on my extensive research, travel, and discussions with scientists and art historians, it has become clear that singing bowls are related to both decorative bowls from the Near East and musical instruments from the Far East. In fact, Himalayan singing bowls seem to be a synthesis of ideas from East and West. Clues about their history place singing bowls in the middle of the ancient world where they developed along ancient trade routes. These routes connected many cultures over vast distances. The story of singing bowls mirrors the story of Asian culture. The quality of the bowls reflects the state of the cultures that produced them. The best examples are found from wealthy times, while few are found where war and hardship persisted. The bowls exemplify the interaction of cultures through trade and the sharing of technology. They are a type of a time capsule reflecting the wealth, refinement, and skill of the people who made them. Antique singing bowls found today intrinsically retain their heritage in their very form. Singing bowls were most prevalent where Buddhism flourished and are often associated with Buddhism. Today's singing bowls are still part of the living ancient traditions in several countries. They are made today in alphabetical order in China, India, Japan, Korea, Nepal, and Vietnam. In ancient times, they may have spread more widely across many civilizations from present-day Iran all the way to Japan. Pictured is uh, one of the oldest singing bowls I ever collected. Um, this example it displays very advanced crusty oxidation, which will be explained later in the book and may date from the very earliest period of 800 to 1,000 years ago. Singing bowls are associated with Buddhism and may have originally been Buddhist alms bowls. They would have been multi-purpose used for many activities. They are used for collecting donations, making sound, and also as utilitarian vessels for eating, drinking, carrying, and storing. The tradition of using alms bowls transformed over time in most Buddhist countries. Today, singing bowls are mainly used symbolically as musical instruments. They are used in temples and monasteries for meditation, music, and collecting donations. They're used in homes as shrine objects and tools for daily prayer and meditation. Singing bowls are made in a variety of sizes from 2 inch diameter to over 3 feet across. Antique singing bowls range from about 3 inch diameter to 13 inch diameter. There are a variety of shapes and every culture produced their own unique types. While I will discuss singing bowls from different cultures, the focus of this book is on the Himalayan singing bowls of Nepal, commonly referred to as Tibetan singing bowls. Himalayan singing bowls have the nicest sound, are the most widely available, and are the most desirable to collectors. They were likely also the first singing bowls made. Himalayan bowls may be called by their Nepali names such as Jambadi, which means big bowl, Thadobadi, which means straight bowl. Some sellers invent names, which are not traditional, but rather uh, used as a modern marketing tool, such as a Buddha bowl or a Bodhi bowl. Traditionally, they come in a wide variety of sizes, shapes, and thus tones, and pictured here are several types and sizes. Singing bowls produce one of the warmest, most pleasant, and magical sounds of any musical instrument. A combination of factors result in singing bowls producing a powerful and uniquely beautiful sound. The metal, shape, and handmade construction combine to create a vibration that is warm and melodic with a unique power to relax the body and focus the mind. 
Singing bowls sound unlike any other object in the world. The sound is often described as a voice. The sound does share many qualities with the human voice, which is one of the reasons they're called singing bowls. Like other musical instruments, singing bowls produce a fundamental tone and two or three audible harmonic overtones. The fundamental tone is the deepest audible tone. The overtones are higher pitched. The fundamental tone varies from very deep and rumbling large bowls to high pitched small bowls with remarkable clarity. The fundamental tone is considered the first harmonic. The second harmonic is an octave higher than the fundamental. The third harmonic is an octave higher than the second. Sometimes a fourth harmonic can be heard. Other frequencies are present but are either outside of our normal hearing range or blend with the other tones and cannot be discerned. Six tones can usually be measured with spectrographic technology. The combination of the fundamental tone and harmonic overtones produces a unique musical chord. Each frequency is a different musical note and their combination creates the voice of the bowl. How the various tones interact determines whether the bowl sounds in tune or out of tune. Singing bowls are often out of tune, either slightly or greatly. An out of tune singing bowl may sound dark and mysterious, complex and interesting, or just dissonant and unpleasant. If the various frequencies are well in tune, the sound is very beautiful and harmonious, has a magical effect on our ears, minds, and hearts. The tone is musical and clear. It has a special calming and soothing effect. At the same time, the experience is energizing and delightful. No other instrument does what a singing bowl can do, but not all singing bowls can do it. The ideal is a real hand-hammered bronze bowl which is well tuned. The complex chord of multiple frequencies is the essence of a singing bowl's character. The chord varies from one bowl to another, making each bowl seem very unique. Subtle variations in the tonal relationships do make them unique, but some bowls sound virtually identical. Two bowls can sound alike but have very different size and shape. The tone is determined partly by the size, but more importantly by the thickness of the bowl. The thicker the metal, the higher the pitch. A small thin bowl can sound the same as a large thick bowl. And pictured here, I show an example of two bowls of the same diameter, one much thicker, which sounds very high pitch, and one much thinner, which will always sound deeper. Sound is vibration. It is a physical event. Hearing is our ability to detect the movement of energy from a vibrating source. We actually feel sound through our ears and skin. The vibration of a singing bowl can be clearly felt. The feeling is wonderful. The universal reaction is a smile and a desire to hold the bowl. Through our feeling and ability to be moved by the sound, singing bowls can improve and enhance our lives. Singing bowls have become the most popular sound healing tools, which are instruments used specifically for personal well-being and health. True singing bowls are made from bronze, which is a mix of copper and tin. The bronze used in singing bowls is a special preparation known as bell metal bronze. Bell metal contains a higher percentage of tin than normal bronze. The proportions of copper and tin and special preparation of the metal by heat make bell metal bronze the, most, the best sounding metal known to humanity. It has the, been the metal of choice for singing bowls, bells, cymbals, gongs, and other metal instruments for thousands of years. Today, handmade singing bowls are still made from bell metal bronze, while new machine finished bowls are made of brass. Brass is a mix of copper and zinc and does not sound as nice as the traditional bronze. Brass sounds dull and does not vibrate as long as bronze. Most bowls sold today as singing bowls are in fact mass produced brass bowls. Hand hammered bronze bowls are the true singing bowls following the ancient tradition. 
Five factors determine the sound of a singing bowl. The bronze alloy, bowl shape, variations in the thickness, form of the lip, and changes due to the age. These physical properties combine to create the unique sound of an individual singing bowl. Variations in the surface due to the hand-hammered construction produce uniquely complex overtones. The round shape of a singing bowl creates a resonating chamber similar to the body of a drum. The resonating chamber produces an echo effect which gives a singing bowl a full tone. The shape and thickness of the bowl rim changes the pitch and duration of the tone. Along with the handmade craftsmanship, the bronze alloy is a big part of what makes a singing bowl sound so nice. Bronze rings beautifully and bell metal bronze sounds particularly good. Antique singing bowls generally sound superior to new singing bowls due to changes in the bronze during the aging process. However, a high quality new bowl can sound better than a poor quality antique. Since singing bowls are handmade, there is a great deal of variation in the tone. Not all singing bowls sound nice. When shopping for a singing bowl, it is important to hear how it sounds because most are out of tune and sound dissonant. A large number are broken and make a rattling sound. Some bowls lack volume or the sound fades too quickly. Listening to a bowl before purchase is essential. Unfortunately, there is a lot of misinformation about singing bowls in books and on the internet. Myths and lies are common and it is difficult for consumers to find the truth. This has been my main motivation to write this book. Some of the most common misconceptions have to do with the metal content, history, traditional use, and beliefs about healing power. Mystique follows the instruments and many false stories are told about them often to drive up the prices. Due to a wide variety of quality and large number of fakes, caution and education are essential. This book will give you all the keys to understand these wonderful objects. Pictured a rare 15th century singing bowl with a very thick shape and a specially folded lip, which will be explained soon. And on the bottom are the uh, hand-hammered new singing bowls we offer at Himalayan Bowls, still made in the traditional way. Chapter 2, Singing Bowl Origins Pictured is a 16th century Tibetan painting depicting a meditating sage with a singing bowl. The bowl is characteristic with engravings on the rim. It sits on a red cushion with an implement inside and a cloth cover behind. A monkey holds a branch of leaves with red berries just above the bowl as if making an offering. The monk is turned toward the bowl as if listening. A monkey in the foreground offers him more fruit and a deer faces the bowl. Compositionally, the bowl is very prominent in this painting. This is the earliest known artistic depiction of a singing bowl. Who invented singing bowls? At some point in history, the first person made the first sound with a bronze bowl. We will never know who first made the discovery, where or when the first bronze bowl was played for sound. The exact person, place, and year is lost to history. However, through years of research and searching the world for answers, I have gotten close to the origin. One of the myths about singing bowls is that they were invented by a shaman or a monk somewhere in the Himalayan mountains, perhaps in a flash of meditative inspiration. Living in a pristine valley, surrounded by treasures, he began crafting singing bowls one by one. It is a romantic image, but quite far from the reality. We may prefer to imagine such a mythic invention, perhaps like a scene from a painting. Visualizing a perfect world is an important part of Buddhist practice. However, the reality of metalwork is far less enchanting. It is unlikely that a monk or spiritual teacher invented or ever crafted singing bowls. It is very likely that they were discovered by accident. The first singing bowl was just a bowl that sounded nice. It may have been a monk's bowl or a normal household bowl. Someone started tapping the bowl to reproduce the nice sound. They were later developed into specialized musical instruments. 
It is not known who first used bronze bowls to make sound. The evidence indicates that early singing bowls were alms bowls used by Buddhist monks. Perhaps a monk first discovered that his bowl made a nice sound and started the tradition by playing it every day. If a whole monastery took up the practice, it could spread easily to new people and places. Perhaps a craftsman made a discovery while making bowls. Just as Pythagoras is said to have been inspired by the sound of hammering metal on an anvil, perhaps singing bowl sound was discovered during manufacturing. It could have been discovered by a bowl maker, a monk, or a child in the kitchen. Whoever had the inspiration or made the accidental discovery, it is certain that craftspeople did the labor of making the bowls. Monks did not spend their time hammering metal. Highly skilled and specialized artisans make handicrafts, including singing bowls. It is doubtful that singing bowls originated in the mountains at all, where resources are scarce and innovation generally arrives late. Given the tens of thousands of singing bowls that were made, it is likely they were made in a collective effort as they are today, by handicraft families who pass on their trade to successive generations. These families of artisans are located near centers of trade and commerce, like Kathmandu, where many traditional handicrafts are still made in the traditional manner. Singing bowls and other handicrafts are manufactured by artisan families and traded in the city by merchants, the way they have been for centuries. While monks and shamans are busy with prayer, rituals, and helping people, artisans are busy making objects. Some monks and shamans are indeed great artists. They design paintings, statues, and sacred objects. When a monk creates a design, they rely on artisans to produce their creation. Art objects may be designed by a monk, but final works of art will be made by artists. They may describe their vision, draw it, or make a prototype for reproduction. This is how many ritual objects were created and recreated. Some were even created after visions and dreams by high lamas, including the Dalai Lamas. Once the vision is described, it can be reproduced. Objects made in multiplicity, like offering bowls, singing bowls, furniture, carpets, are made by craftspeople. The division of labor is clear and can still be seen today. Asian cultures have great traditions of artisans, each specializing in their trade and passing their skill and secret techniques from generation to generation. Old cities in Asia still have artisan neighborhoods, bustling with noisy workshops. You can watch crafts being made and buy handmade objects of all types. I have visited artisan neighborhoods in several countries and observed many traditional crafts like weaving, wood carving, painting, statue making, bowl making, and all types of metalwork. It is very interesting to observe the amazing skill and dedication to craft. So, it is possible that monks started the tradition of playing singing bowls, but they did not do the labor to make them. The metalworking professions go back thousands of years. Artisans specialize in one type of metal or a particular type of object. For example, I know a family who are well known for making silver statues, and another who specialize in hammering embossed designs in copper. One family makes symbols and another offering cups etc. In some cases, a whole village specializes in one craft or another. Such is the case with singing bowls where several families work together to make the bronze and hammer the bowls in a collective effort. In Nepal, the ancient arts are still alive. Small family workshops are common in and around Kathmandu. You can observe, you can observe two or three generations of artisans working together the grandfather passing his knowledge on to his sons and grandsons. Traditional types of metalwork, which have been mostly lost to the rest of the world, have been kept alive, including lost wax casting, copper repoussé, and annealing. Annealing is the technique used to make singing bowls. It is a process of repeatedly heating and cooling the metal so it can be hammered for a long period of time into the shape of a bowl. Singing bowls evolved over time into the specialized sound instrument we know today. They did not appear from a vision or develop independent from society. They're part of a large metalworking tradition.
From their humble beginnings as pretty metal bowls, they have become one of the most beautiful sound instruments ever made. The adherence of the craftspeople to tradition shows remarkable dedication and mastery. Examples of singing bowls from the last several hundred years show a remarkable consistency in form, materials, and manufacturing techniques. They have been made using the same metal for their entire history. Some of the more masterful manufacturing techniques have been lost, but the overall methods have remained the same. The process has not changed for centuries, and singing bowls are still made using the Bronze Age technology from 5,000 years ago. Singing bowls are part of an ancient unbroken line of craftsmanship passed on generation after generation. It is amazing to hold a handmade object knowing that it is part of a long and important tradition. Here are some more photos I took in Nepal. Some young monks praying at Bodha Stupa. And a photo of the traditional shop houses which have uh, stood in Kathmandu for a thousand years. Um, there are the primary residences in the city with workshops, stores, and restaurants on the ground floor and residences above. Uh, this picture is an 800-year-old building uh, in the old part of Kathmandu, and some have been continuously occupied by the same family for hundreds of years. Utilitarian origins of singing bowls. Pictured here is an ancient ceramic bowl which I photographed in Cambodia. The shape is very similar to many singing bowls and actually it was found in a museum next to some bronze bowls which are uh, related to singing bowls. An accidental discovery. There are many possible origins for the first singing bowls. The simplest and most likely origin is that they evolved from normal utilitarian bowls which happened to make a beautiful sound. Someone noticed that some bowls made a nice, nice sound. They started playing the bowls and sharing the sounds with other people. It may have been a musician in the kitchen who was uh, first played the bowls for music. Or it may have been a Buddhist monk who discovered he could use his alms bowl as a bell. It may have been a bowl maker who noticed the beautiful sound while he was making his bowls. From some humble beginning, the singing bowls took on purpose and special usage. Over time, the form was perfected as bowls were manufactured specifically to make sound. While the exact origin is unknown, the importance of the bowl form is undeniable. Bowls are practical and useful, but they are also symbolic and revered. Singing bowls elevate the humble utilitarian bowl to a special symbolic object. Imagine living in a time and place where the technology consisted of a few simple wood, stone, and metal implements, where there were no plastic containers, no refrigerators, no effective means to store or transport food. Water was held in an animal skin or a length of bamboo. Food was cooked on hot stones. Food was served wrapped in leaves and eaten by hand. Imagine the innovation of a bowl in such an environment. A bowl is a life-changing technology. More than a convenience, a bowl can mean the difference between life and death. Bowls also allow transport and storage better than a basket or a cloth sack. Starting with baskets, ceramics, and later copper, Early containers spread throughout the ancient world thousands of years ago. Some of the most common archaeological finds are pottery shards. Baskets were developed by ancient cultures around the world. Containers are very important historically, and they are containers are very important historically as they are in our everyday life. The bowl is an incredibly useful innovation. Even if it was only made from a leaf, one of the first objects ever produced was essentially a bowl. Bowls help sustain life by holding food and water. Bowls were so important they became symbols in many religions. Bowls are symbols for bounty, medicine, wealth in various cultures. They are used as trophies and religious implements. In ancient Buddhism, the only objects a monk would keep were his robe and a bowl. The singing bowls are important symbols and likely evolved directly out of the tradition of Buddhist alms bowls.
Kids love to make noise with just about any object they get their hands on. I'm a lifelong musician, and like many kids, my early musical career was not limited to the piano. As a child, I loved to take out pots and pans and explore the percussive and tonal qualities of glass, plastic, and especially metal. When my parents took me to a restaurant, they could count on me making music with whatever was on the table. I still like to tap on objects to see how they sound. Many people know the old trick of making sound by rubbing the rim of a crystal wine glass. In India, there is a tradition, unrelated to singing bowls by the way, where they use normal ceramic bowls to play music. Multiple bowls are partially filled with water in order to tune them into specific musical notes. The amount of water in the bowl changes the pitch and songs can be played like a piano. Benjamin Franklin invented a musical instrument called a glass harmonica. Crystal orbs of various sizes are arranged in a horizontal axis and uh, a mechanism rotates them. When touched, the orbs make a musical tone. Franklin was inspired by the ability to make sound by rubbing the rim of a crystal glass. He built the instrument that perfected the technique. Franklin's instrument is very rare today, but even Mozart composed a composition for the glass harmonica. The inventors of these and other musical instruments were inspired by utilitarian objects. Vessels all. Here's a photo I took of a set of 19th century musical glasses. Singing bowls may have been invented the same way. Someone was making sound with his mother's kitchen bowl and had a great idea. A monk started to tap his alms bowl to alert people to his presence. A bowl maker noticed that some of his bowls had a special sound and started to make them specifically for that purpose. However it started, the phenomenon spread due to the beautiful sound. In the centuries that followed, singing bowls became more specialized and widely known. The form was perfected and they were no longer utilitarian bowls. They became unique musical instruments with special features designed to make a beautiful sound. They were made in larger sizes and placed in temples, becoming more symbolic and prized by communities. They were made in different shapes in different cultures. Various sizes were developed for different environments, some for personal use and others for communal use. Singing bowls are intimately related to Buddhism and the most likely scenario is that they developed from Buddhist alms bowls. The original use of singing bowls for sound would have been monks calling people to make donations. This practice can still be observed today and may be the original way singing bowls were used. Alms bowls, whether a personal monk's bowl or a temple collection bowl, also developed out of utilitarian need. At first, they were simply a bowl for food and drink. Their symbolic importance came later. Ultimately, all bowls reflect back to their innate function to store and carry, their usefulness to provide food and drink. While we may think it's just a bowl, again, imagine living in a culture where a bowl, a bowl does not exist. Imagine being on the edge of civilization when they first were introduced. Bowls are important, life-sustaining objects. They are essential for survival and thereby became objects of veneration and vessels of religious significance. In Buddhism, they became a prominent symbol because of the monastic practices of collecting alms and tending to one's bowl. Bowls are still central to the life of monks. Even the Buddha's own stone bowl had a real purpose. It was a life-sustaining object to eat and drink from. It was later transformed into a religious symbol and mythic artifact. Many types of bowls and cups have been adopted by religious uh, by religions as ritual devices. Many types of bowls and cups have been adopted by religions as ritual devices. All of the world's religions use bowls and vessels in various ways. Singing bowls hold a special place of reverence, but likely started as everyday objects. They were normal bowls which were discovered to have special properties. Over time, they became more symbolic and specialized as sound instruments. Early singing bowls were not plentiful, but they were beautifully crafted with special features to produce the best sound. 
The very oldest examples do not produce a beautiful sound, but soon they were perfected with shapes and design features that improved the tone. As more singing bowls were made, they reached a high point of masterful quality around the 17th century. Then there was a period of mass production for nearly 200 years, indicating more people wanted singing bowls. They were made with more simple construction methods and in greater numbers. Following this time, there was a low point as the world entered the modern era. Finally, with the rediscovery of singing bowls by the whole world, more are made now than ever before. Here's a photo of one of my own paintings of the Medicine Buddha uh, with his bowl, which is not related to a singing bowl. And a picture below of a 2,000-year-old uh, stone relief depicting the Buddha with his bowl, uh, which in this depiction resembles a singing bowl. Uh, the sculpture is from Pakistan, where Buddhism flourished in ancient times. The style of the relief is a mix of Asian and Roman influence, and part of the key of understanding the evolution of singing bowls is understanding the cross-cultural mixing that has occurred throughout history. A photo I took in Kathmandu of a Buddha statue holding a singing bowl rather than the typical Buddha bowl. A little cultural mixing there. There is a second Chinese singing bowl in the front covered with the green prayer scarf. This is the traditional location for a singing bowl on an altar at the bottom left side, left and right uh, from the point of view of the Buddha on the altar. This was taken at the beautiful uh, Pulhari Monastery in Kathmandu, um, as was the uh, stupa below which holds the remains of the previous Jamgong Control Rinpoche, who is a very revered teacher. Buddhist Origins of Singing Bowls The Buddha's Bowl Bowls are very important in Buddhist tradition, starting with the Buddha's own bowl more than 2,500 years ago. Some people say that the Buddha's bowl was a singing bowl, but this is not correct. The time of the historic Buddha is more than 1,500 years earlier than any singing bowl. In some ancient art depictions of the Buddha, his bowl does closely, remember, res does closely resemble a singing bowl. However, the Buddha's bowl is known to have been made of stone. The myth of the Buddha's bowl says that the Buddha crafted it by squeezing together four bowls of offerings given to him by spiritual beings. And so the bowl has lines around the top where the four bowls were combined. Singing bowls also commonly have lines engraved around the top. The engraved lines in a singing bowl may be symbolic of the Buddha's bowl. However, since the number of lines in a singing bowl varies from 1 to 12 lines, it is not clear whether singing bowl line engravings are related to Buddhist symbology. The lines are more likely decorative. There is another story that the Buddha repaired his bowl after it was broken into eight pieces. Alms bowls from Thailand are made in eight pieces, symbolizing the repair made in the Buddha's bowl. Some say that Buddha's bowl still exists. Others say it was broken again and the pieces scattered to different Buddhist kingdoms. The Buddha's bowl was such a powerful symbol that controversy and even warfare surrounded control of the bowl and its alleged shards. Today, there are holy sites in several countries said to contain shards of the Buddha's bowl. The National Museum in Afghanistan and Kabul claimed a large bowl in their possession to be the intact bowl. However, the validity of the claim has been rejected because the bowl size is much too large for a person to hold. Some Westerners make outlandish claims that they own the Buddha's bowl. The Buddha's bowl was even the subject of a fictional TV show. The real history and resting place of the Buddha's stone bowl is unknown. The exaggerated tales makes it even more difficult to discover the truth. Whatever the real history of the Buddha's bowl, it is clear that bowls are powerful symbols in Buddhism. They signify wealth, abundance, health, protection, the bestowal of blessings, and connection with divine powers. Alms bowls. Traditionally, the abandonment of possessions was a requirement to enter a Buddhist monastery. The tradition gave rise to the alms bowl, one of the only possessions a monk would keep. The bowls were, and still are, used to collect donations and to eat from. 
The, tr the tradition is for monks to go out in the early morning and collect donations of food from local people. Whatever they collect in their bowl is all they will eat for the day. Today, monks may collect food or money in their alms bowl. In this way, the monks directly rely on the generosity of the public for their survival. The tradition is no longer practiced in many sects, but can still be observed in some places, especially the Theravada traditions in Thailand and Myanmar. In the time of the Buddha, bowls were made from stone or wood. Over time, the alms bowls began to be made from metal, probably due to the influence of metal craft from Thailand and China. While the exact origin of singing bowls is unknown, it is my belief that singing bowls were originally alms bowls that were developed to be multi-purpose tools. They were used for collecting donations, eating, drinking, carrying, and also for making sound. Eventually, the bowls became shrine objects and instruments for meditation and prayer. Alms bowls from some traditions do not make sound at all. These bowls are distinctly different from singing bowls. Thai alms bowls are made from eight pieces of metal welded together and finished by hammering and grinding. Due to the material is used and the method of making the bowls from several pieces, they do not make a bell sound. While there is no relation between Thai alms bowls and singing bowls, they may have grown out of the same alms bowl tradition. Thai Buddhism is a quiet tradition. In the more mystical bell-ringing traditions of Tibet and Japan, singing bowls were common. Singing bowls in these traditions were likely first developed as alm bowls and later became the symbolic singing bowls found today on home altars, in monasteries, and in temples. In an ironic modern twist, tourists visiting Thailand recently started tapping on alms bowls believing they were singing bowls. The sellers began offering them with playing sticks due to the demand of tourists looking for singing bowls. They do not make a nice sound, but the Thai people are very accommodating to the, demanding, to the demands of tourists. Pictured here is a uh, typical shape of an alms bowl being held by a statue. Beautiful statue at Doi Sutep in northern Thailand. Singing bowls as symbolic alms bowls. Pictured here is a Buddhist monk playing a singing bowl uh, in a temple in Vietnam, uh, northern Vietnam in De Lot. And um, this is actually one of the only times that I've seen a singing bowl actually being used in a temple. Most singing bowls are similar in size as the typical monk's alms bowl about seven inches across. Some Buddhist sects use singing bowls and others do not. The traditions of collecting daily alms was abandoned by some sects altogether. Yet singing bowls continue to be used in those traditions. As the tradition evolved, individual monks stopped collecting alms and singing bowls became one of the symbolic objects placed in the temple. Some were made smaller for use on home shrines, and some were made larger for this use in the temples. Singing bowls continued to be used in ways related to alms collection. In Vietnam, I photographed a monk playing a singing bowl in the temple. As he played, patrons approached one by one and dropped money into the singing bowl. The connection between sound, donations, and the bowl is clear in this example. The singing bowl is a tool used to call the patrons, which is a similar function of other Buddhist musical instruments. Instruments are both practical and symbolic. They're used practically for communication, to ask patrons for do donation as a single to signal to begin and end meditation, to call monks to the temple. They're uh, used uh, also symbolically for veneration, to carry prayers on the air uh, with the sound, to unify the group uh, in meditation, and to relax the mind by the vibration. Here's a home shrine at my friend's home in Japan with a small singing bowl in the lower corner, food and water uh, which are offered every day. They strike the bowl two times. Ding, 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 ding. The bowl uh, represents the offering of music, uh, which is one of the traditional eight offerings in Buddhism. 
The other traditional offerings are arranged on the shrine along with a photo of a deceased family member, my friend's grandparents, um, to whom the shrine is dedicated. Japan is one of the best places to see singing bowls in use today. Japanese singing bowls come in small, medium, and large sizes. Every temple has at least one large singing bowl and often contain medium and small singing bowls as well. Home shrines include one small singing bowl and sometimes a medium singing bowl. In Japanese temples, large singing bowls are placed prominently on front of the altar. In a meditation hall, they are placed in front of the monks who play music. Some Japanese singing bowls are very large. I have observed in Japan and Vietnam that the wealthier temples have the largest singing bowls. The singing bowl is used for sound, but also as a symbol for the generous donations of the temple's patrons. In this way, the monk's alms bowl became a stationary singing bowl used to gather donations for an entire temple. The larger bowl indicates the ability to make larger collections and also provides a bountiful return of blessings to the patrons. The most wealthy temples have a very large singing bowl to guarantee prosperity and abundant blessings. No longer just a modest bowl held by a monk, large temple bowls stand for a whole community. And here is pictured the largest of them all, uh, the giant sized singing bowl at Zojoji Temple in Tokyo, which is three feet across. It is really huge uh, you can see a much smaller singing bowl next to it which is not a very small singing bowl that one is uh, at least 10 or 12 inches across and um, you can see the cushion there too where a monk would sit just to give you a sense of the scale and luckily there was someone walking by a monk behind it a few feet this tradition of large donation bowls produce i'm sorry this tradition of large donation bowls predates singing bowls. Early Buddhist temples used stone bowls to collect donations. The large stone bowl I mentioned in the Kabul Museum was a large donation bowl used in a grand Buddhist temple. It was made in a huge size to emphasize the wealth of its patrons and stability of the temple. A large bowl overflowing with donations and blessings symbolizes power and is thought to promote benefits like good fortune and affluence. While donations are still collected in singing bowls in Vietnam, in Japan, donations are collected in wooden boxes. Japanese singing bowls lost their function as collection vessels when they were replaced by the more secure boxes, which are locked up, by the way. However, the bowls retain their symbolic significance and daily function as musical instruments. Singing bowls are used at the beginning and end of a meditation period, both as a signal and to promote a meditative state. They are used for sound when making offerings, and the sound is seen as a connecting thread to the spirit world. In Japan, singing bowls are considered sacred objects rather than the collection vessels for money. They are part of the ensemble of ritual musical instruments. It is a living example of how singing bowl traditions vary from culture to culture and have changed over time. So you still see them used in a similar way in some remote temples in Vietnam. And, and then in a place like Japan where there's been, uh, you know, many periods of cultural change, uh, at some point there were probably robberies having, happening from the donations in the bowls. And so someone came up with the idea of these wooden uh, boxes which are used today, which if you've ever seen are secure. They look like uh, a little jail cell for money. They're a, a wooden box with rails on the top um, where you can throw money. And in some of the more popular temples, even those are remote. So you have to throw your money <laughs> into the donation box. Um, and I'm, I'm sure this was historically for uh, a security measure. And then the bowls themselves were brought inside the temple and uh, became uh, either a ritual musical instrument or a shrine object. Another example uh, is found in a film from South Korea titled Why Has Bodhidharma Left for the East? Beautiful film about Buddhist monks. And in the film, there's a scene that shows a monk collecting alms with his bowl. In this case, the bowl is made of wood. 
which is a symbol of a poor monk. The monk uses the bowl as a musical instrument as well as a donation bowl. So he goes into town and stands in a busy place, taps the bowl rhythmically to announce his presence. But it's also a meditative tone. The people hear the sound and drop donations in his bowl. The sound of the bowl is very meditative. He collects alms and also eats and drinks from the bowl. This is a contemporary example of how an alms bowl serves multiple functions. This is how bowls have been used for centuries as instruments and vessels. It is likely that singing bowls originated in this way as alms bowls that became more specialized and more symbolic over time. The relationship between collecting donations and making sound is today practiced in only a few places. Pictured is a type of singing bowl with a uh, slightly curved shape similar to a monk's alms bowl. This type often has an inscription near the rim, uh, almost always has multiple characters, uh, likely the name of the monk who owned the bowl. 